I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here with all these fine folks today and to taste a little bit of the culture. Lord, thank you for everything. This is truly a blessing for bringing us all out here today and let us get ready to eat. Amen. Brunswick was the only deep water port in North Carolina. Everything begins in the Lower Cape Fear, begins and ends with Brunswick. The history of the Lower Cape Fear has not been told in depth the way it should have. The rice, the rice was basically what made the South rich. Right along the, the Cape Fear coming up from South Carolina, from, from Southport, North Carolina, every five or 10 miles, you're gonna run into a little small community of, of African Americans. And basically those were the, the places where the rice plantations were. And a lot of the folks when they left home or when they grew up, they didn't never move very far from those plantations. Well, I'm from Eastern North Carolina. I grew up here in Wilmington, North Carolina. My background was strong vegetarian cooking. I was raised a Seventh Day at Venice, and my family was just super proud of culture and everything that's natural and holistic, and that was my foundation and my background. And when I found out about the Gullah people and the West Africans that had migrated to the coast of the Carolinas, Georgia, I was thoroughly intrigued. Seeing the amount of linkage with food, with dialect, and they have a they have a completely distinct dialect that they use amongst themselves. Many of those individuals were from the rice growing regions of West Africa, places like Sierra Leone and Senegambia, and because of that they had the skills and the culture that would have been considered uh, very close to what we think of as the Gullah culture today. Okay, the Gullah Geechee Corridor runs from Jacksonville, North Carolina down to Jacksonville, Florida, and I want to say about 30 miles inland. And, but it's, it's primarily dealing with where the Gullahs ended up being placed. So Brunswick County in the Lower Cape Fear was an ideal location for rice growing because of its environment. The earliest rice growing that occurs here in the area is what we know as upland rice cultivation. Um, essentially, this would have been large swampy areas that would have been flooded by summer rainfall and sometimes water diverted to those areas from ponds such as Orton Pond. That's the reason why it was constructed in the 18th century. But what really takes this area into a new level in terms of rice growing is after the American Revolution, many of these rice plantations shift towards the Cape Fear River and towards what we call tidal rice cultivation where these fields would have been right on the edges of the river itself. Uh, you would have had these swampy areas that could be easily flooded according to the tides and a lot of engineering brought in and all sorts of infrastructure to irrigate the fields based on a system of dikes and canals and all sorts of floodgates to control the amount of water that would come in and off of the fields because rice had to be germinated and grow for much of its growing season in water. Um, so with harnessing that tidal power, uh, it cuts down on the amount of labor that is involved in uh, rice cultivation, and it also just works a whole lot better. Uh, I think for a lot of folks watching this, we weren't around before refrigeration, BR. And so uh, that was very common at, at that particular time because of the places that they stayed. They couldn't really cook on the inside, and they didn't have a stove on the inside. And so everything was done on the outside, cast iron, whether you, you learned how to bake on the fire, learned how to stew on the fire itself. And uh, it was one of those kind of things where we had to do, do some adaptations when it came to cooking out there. But I, I think that getting back to that frame of mind from time to time can give you an appreciation for the, the folks and everything they went through. And, and it gives you appreciation for the food as well. The rice, the catfish, the oysters, the crabs, all of the different things that comprise 
really great Gullah cuisine. As a descendant of rice cultivators, I feel a sense of pride and I feel a sense of connection to our mother continent. That's one of the things that we brought over here. That wasn't here before we got here. And we, even though we were stripped from so much of our selves, we still held on to so much of our culture and, and have been able to pass it on and pass it on. And it's, in, it's gone on for generations and that's something to be really proud of, the resilience of our people. My ties to Brunswick County is through my great-grandfathers on my mother's side and my father's side. I, I've always loved to cook. When I was six, my, six, my father built a box so I could reach the stove because it wasn't quite tall enough. So I've been cooking a long time. It's just a blessing from the law. I have two sons and a daughter, and they all can cook. And rice is one of the main things that they do cook. We have a lot of rice. <laughs> yeah, we do. My favorite, favorite rice dish is definitely neck bones of rice because I would go down to my granny and pop pop's house and there was always something on the stove. Neck bone, neck bones and rice. I love, I love neck bones and rice, I tell you. Um, I don't even know, I don't even know how I got, I mean, it's like, it's, it's been a part of my life it's just, ever since I can remember. Shrimp fried rice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love rice. In fact, I have what, 10 pounds at, at the house right now. I eat rice two or three times a week, and all rice dishes are my favorite. I think the rise of the Gullah Chef was going to happen regardless. I think when you cook good food and you cook good food from the soul, there's a certain spotlight. I'm obligated to be able to cook Gullah cuisine and we take it to a higher level. And we educate on that as well. And so in the restaurant, when we're preparing Gullah cuisine, my servers know the origin of the dish, they can speak on that dish, and also go out and enlighten my customers as well. If you have elders that still know something about the Gullah Geechee culture, ask them questions, young people. I learned so much um, about our culture by sitting at my grandfather's feet and literally asking him questions. So just more connections with your elders, get together with your family, talk to your granny, ask her about the food that she used to make. Where did that come from? Ask her why she pronounces words certain ways and, and you know, different things like that. And then they'll open up and talk to you about, you know, how they grew up. And that's how you help preserve that culture and language. Our history and our culture is American history and American culture. We we're constantly bombarded with uh, things of the past that are always negative. And so what a great refreshing break with something positive with hearing about the culture that's been here on the coast of the Carolinas and Georgia that a lot of folks just don't know about. And on the outside, it looks like maybe this culture is dying because a lot of people are not as aware, but a culture only dies when you stop talking about it. And as long as there are black people here in the Lower Cape Fear region and all the way down to Florida, it's gonna be some people celebrating and loving Gullah Geechee culture. So we out here, we ain't going nowhere. Speak for us, yeah. Thank you.